Welcome to the 389th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome public historian Jason Steinauer, author of History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. A reminder, you can usually catch COVID calls live on weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and future topics. As always, please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, December 13th, 2021, there are 5,308,168 deaths from COVID-19. Globally, that's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. I've been reading an obituary or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is David Hackett, historian and Holocaust expert, dies at 80. This was written by Alex Vadukul and was published December 2nd, 2020 in the New York Times. Teenager growing up in El Paso in the 1950s, David Hackett looked forward to Sunday evenings with the German family, the Bornsteins. Goulash and Sauerbraten were served. His parents sipped schnapps with Dr. Bornstein and his wife. David got to sit next to their daughter, Olga. But what he relished most about those evenings was their salon-like atmosphere. It was at these gatherings that he started to grasp that Dr. Bornstein was a Holocaust survivor who had fled Europe in the 1940s. As he learned more, his fascination with world history grew and later blossomed into a career. He studied in Munich as a Fulbright scholar in the 1960s and became fluent in German. He became a history professor at the University of Texas at El Paso, where he worked for more than 40 years, specializing in Germany and early 20th century Europe. In 1995, he published the Buchenwald Report, his translation of an exhaustive document made by German-speaking U.S. Army officers at the Buchenwald concentration camp shortly after its liberation in 1945. The complete report, which was originally thought to have been lost after the war, contained interviews with prisoners and graphic details about the camp's conditions. It was partly intended for Germans with the aim of countering Holocaust denial. I transcribed, collated, and restored the organization of the original German language text contained on 400 yellowed, brittle, and blurry sheets of carbon copy paper, Professor Hackett wrote in a preface. Professor Hackett died on November 15th at a hospital, November 15th, 2020, at a hospital in El Paso. He was 80. The cause was complications of COVID-19, his daughter, Mary Elizabeth Hackett, said. I think it was the ultimate puzzle for him, as Hackett said, of her father's work. How could a country that produced Goethe... Mozart and Beethoven also be responsible for the horrors of the Holocaust. He wanted to understand it because it was so incomprehensible. David Hackett was born David Andrew Welper on January 29, 1940 in Rensselaer, Indiana. His father, Andrew Dale Welper, an engineer, died of sepsis when David was four. His mother, Margaret Welper, a homemaker, married Clarence G. Hackett, a child psychologist who adopted David and gave him his surname. The family later settled in El Paso, and David graduated from Austin High School there in 1958. After graduating from Earlham College in Indiana with a bachelor's degree in history, he received his doctorate from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. His PhD dissertation, which ran 457 pages, was titled The Nazi Party in the Reichstag Election of 1930. As a Fulbright scholar, Professor Hackett lived in a tiny flat in Munich, where his strict landlady brought him crusty rolls each morning for breakfast. In his spare time, he attended the opera and skied in the Bavarian Alps. In addition to his daughter, Mary Elizabeth, he survived by his wife, Anne Hackett, another daughter, Caroline Hackett, a son, Michael, a brother, Don, his stepmother, Helen, two stepbrothers, James and John McHale, two half-sisters, Peggy Heinrichs and Susan Murray, a stepsister, Jennifer Eveler, and six grandchildren. Publishing the Buchenwald Report took its toll on Professor Hackett. 
on Professor Hackett. He had spent more than five years translating the document's brittle yellow pages, working late into the night. It was an emotional effort, his wife said. He found it so shockingly demoralizing to see what one fellow human could do to another, but he also realized its critical importance to not let it be forgotten that this history cannot be denied. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today. Let me introduce my guest to you. I've really been looking forward to bringing him on COVID calls, Jason Steinauer. Jason Steinauer served as founding director of the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest. He's currently a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He's a frequent contributor to Time and CNN, a past editorial board member of the Washington Post's Made by History section, and a presidential counselor of the National World War II Museum. In 2020, he founded the History Club on Clubhouse, which he hosts regularly. The club has more than 100,000 members and averages 2,500 participants per week. And he's the founder and CEO of the History Communication Institute. His first book, History Disrupted, which will be out in hard copy early in the new year, examines how history gets communicated on the World Wide Web. Jason Steinauer, welcome to COVID Calls. Hey, Scott. Great to chat with you. Thank you for having me on. So I like to start the way I generally do, just find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there. I'm currently in Washington, D.C. And uh, part of me wants to say, is there still a pandemic? Because if you walk around D.C. on a regular basis, it's sort of unclear if there's actually a pandemic or not. Uh, not a lot of people wearing masks, a lot of people doing indoor dining, indoor events, especially with holiday season. Uh, there have been a number of indoor events that my wife and I have attended. And I, I feel like there's a lot of mask theater here in Washington, D.C. People actually wear their masks going into the event when they're outside, and then they take them off as soon as they get inside, which to me seems like counterintuitive. Probably should be the other way around. Uh, but it, it is this sort of interesting thing where you sort of know that you're still in a pandemic, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't actually see a lot of evidence that you're still in a pandemic. I find that distressing, but not surprising to to hear that that's, that that's the case. Um, is that related at all to uh, numbers of cases? Uh, to, or is there now just a sort of cognitive dissonance between the pandemic, which plays in its epidemiological course and the way people are acting, as you said, uh, there's sort of a normalization, particularly going into the holidays. I'm in South Korea, so everyone here is wearing a mask outside, inside. There's pretty strict adherence to rules. So there's not yet that sort of dissociation between just wanting to live and act like there's no pandemic and the reality of it. Yeah, I would say a lot of my answers are gonna be anecdotal because uh, I'm, I'm not directly in touch with anyone in DC public health or DC government working on this issue. I will say, <clears throat> I know there's been some pressure on the mayor here, particularly from other areas that are adjacent to DC like uh, Maryland and Virginia to remove the mask mandate for indoor businesses because uh, there are lots of tourists obviously who flock to DC at this time of year for the holidays and restaurant owners, business owners in the area really want those tourists to be able to fully spend their dollars and enjoy all DC has to offer. So there's there was a mask mandate for a while here in DC, but I believe that was lifted because of some of this pressure. It may be coming back because of the new Omicron variant, uh, I'm actually not 100% sure about that, so please don't quote me. I will say, too, just talking to colleagues who work in the federal government or others who are in the D.C. workforce, there's just a lot of pandemic fatigue here. Obviously, D.C. has been at the heart not just of the pandemic, but the political maelstrom and the social justice movements and the protests and the counter protests and marches and riots. And it's been a lot here the past two years. So there's a general sense of fatigue and weariness. And I think people are really desperate to celebrate and commune with people. And so particularly when it comes to holiday party season, I think a lot of people who are vaccinated and boosted are kind of evaluating the risk and saying, I really miss being with people and laughing and smiling because I haven't done that for two years. So I'm going to chance it. Yeah, that exhaustion is is real and it, and it has real implications for people's mental health. There's no doubt about it. Um, Jason, I want to ask you if you wouldn't mind sharing a personal memory of this 
time, something that really defines the pandemic period for you in your life? I would say one of the defining things about the pandemic was and still is Clubhouse. And for those who are not familiar with Clubhouse, it's a social media app that emerged in March of 2020, right as the pandemic was hitting, but really took off in the summer of 2020 and into the fall of 2020. Uh, it's an audio chat platform. So basically you get on and you have audio conversations like we're having right now, except there's no visual attached to it. So it's basically a combination of like a podcast and a conference call. And you can hop into chats anywhere in the world on any different number of subjects. And in the summer of 2020, um, you know, I was one of those people who was feeling a bit worn down by the politics, by the social unrest, by the pandemic, and also some stuff that was going on in my personal professional life. And I kind of stumbled into Clubhouse and I found a community of people where I was able to talk about things that were on my mind, uh, to commune, to laugh, to cry, everything in between. And in the midst of that, I also was finding myself in a lot of conversations that were invoking history. So I started this thing called History Club, which you mentioned. And History Club has blossomed into this semi-weekly show that I host where we talk about history and how it connects to present day events. And I bring scholars on or I talk about things that are on my mind. And we've had anywhere from several hundred people in a room to 10,000 people in a room talking about these issues. So to me, Clubhouse has been one of the silver linings, one of the gifts of the pandemic. It's given me community. It's given me a place to wrestle with ideas. It also greatly informed the book that I just wrote that you mentioned. And that's one of the enduring, lasting things that I'll remember, I think, about this time period. I guess it's fair to say you are an early adopter when it comes to technology and social media, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But just to linger with Clubhouse for a second, it, is it a platform that is, I mean, I think it pre-exists the pandemic, but maybe maybe not. You're telling me, it, it, did it launch literally right around the time of the pandemic, or you joined it right around the time of the pandemic? No, they launched in March of 2020, so their timing was impeccable. What a great time to have an audio app where people can talk to each other when people are stuck at home and can't go out to talk to each other. And uh, I joined in August of 2020. I was I user see. number 7,086. So okay. Pretty so, so this is a platform that literally the thing people were talking about from the beginning was always in the context of the pandemic. How has that colored your conversations on Clubhouse? Clubhouse really expanded the voices that were in my frame of consciousness, particularly as it relates to the pandemic, but also to the political discourse that was happening in America in 2020. Because at the time, as you know, but listeners may not know, I was working inside academia in 2020. And academia, I don't think I'm saying anything too surprising here, tends to be a pretty insular place. You don't necessarily get a ton of voices from other places. Uh, inside academia, and particularly where I was at in the pandemic, it was a lot of conversation with faculty and graduate students, and that's fine. That can be interesting. To get onto Clubhouse, though, and hear perspectives on the pandemic from people all across the country and all across the world in different sectors, in different spheres, from different political persuasions and different backgrounds, that was really eye-opening, hearing what was happening in Bahrain or in United Arab Emirates or in for a period, actually, there was a period where people from mainland China got onto Clubhouse before really? the Chinese government cl um, clamped down on it. That was fascinating because we were getting conversations from people in mainland China who weren't aware or at least claimed to not be aware of what was happening in Hong Kong or what was happening uh, you know, with the Uyghurs out in uh, Western China uh, because they were being censored. And they they were being blocked from that information by the Great Firewall of China and by Chinese authorities. So uh, to even be in it within earshot and to listen in to people who were Uyghur talking to people from uh, Shanghai or Beijing or people from Hong Kong in dialogue with people from the mainland, that was absolutely fascinating. So it really, really expanded the sphere and expanded the voices that I was hearing. And that's why it was just so valuable for me uh, during the pandemic. I just want to remind folks you're listening to COVID Calls, and I'm talking to Jason Steinauer, the author of a book forthcoming. It's actually available already as a Kindle book on Amazon History Disrupted, and he's also 
the host of the History Club on Clubhouse. Jason, um, let's go back a little bit and maybe you can tell me how you first got interested in history. Um, and that may go back very far for you for most of us who are in the history profession and, and adjacent where it does go back a ways. But I'm particularly, particularly interested in how you got um, mixed up with public history because it's a, as a, a sort of, I'm not gonna call it a subfield, it's its own sort of uh, set of methodologies. It's its own you know, population of scholars, researchers and communicators. And that's what you gravitated to and that's where you've been most active. So how did you get drawn into that? I, for me, history has always been part of who I am. And I say that because I'm the grandchild. I'm the grandchild of Holocaust survivors. My grandparents on my mother's side both survived the war, and my mother was born in a displaced persons camp. And I don't actually even know when I first learned that information. There was no sit down at the table where it was like, Jason, this is who we are, and this is where we came from. I just sort of, I just sort of always knew it, even from an early age. And <clears throat> For me, when I think about history, I think the word responsibility comes to mind. And I always carried that responsibility of history from the earliest time that I can remember. Uh, that identity of being the legacy of survivors and having that Holocaust and Jewish heritage in our family always felt like something I was carrying. And, and I always felt like I had a responsibility to talk about it and that it affected the way I moved through the world. So I was interested in history and thinking about history and reading about history from very early ages. It was sort of all around me in some ways. And at the same time, I also had this kind of creative side of my personality. You know, I've, I've, at various points in my life, I've been a musician, I've been an actor, I've done all kinds of public stuff. And when I was a kid, I actually used to make museum exhibits in my parents' basement. I would take like G.I. Joe figures or other action figures. I'd like put exhibit labels and display cases together and have them like kind of tour through. So as I got older into like being a teenager and eventually going to college, I was always looking for ways to marry this responsibility of history with these sort of creative outlets and expression that I always were sort of part of me. And so I kind of stumbled into museum work uh, when I was in college. I interned at the Smithsonian and I also interned at the Horniman Museum in London. And then when I got out of college, I was fortunate to get an entry level job at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which is a Holocaust museum in lower Manhattan. And I got paid $25,000 a year to live in New York City and work on museum exhibits, which I'm sorry to say that the salaries in public history haven't improved all that much since then. Uh, but that was kind of my entry into that world. I didn't actually know it was called public history at the time. I kind of learned about public history as a field a little bit later in my career, but I really gravitated towards museum work. And so that's kind of what started me on the career path that I've ended up having. Thank you for, and I can really picture uh, you putting together the the museum uh, and, and what that must have meant. And and when people uh, toured that museum, I'm assuming family members, maybe, maybe friends, they must have also thought, "Wow, this is a this is a, a kid that we need to get some books in his hands." <laughs> you know, the, I imagine that there was this sort of reciprocity that went on there as well with family, you know, supporting that interest. I know that was true in my family. I was, uh, I had a different take on that. I remember I was always the one on the family trips that was like I would start the chronicle of the trip and be writing down everything that happened and everything everybody said, which might have been kind of irritating to my parents now that I think about it. But they really they kept that to themselves and they and they encouraged it, you know, that that was that somebody should be writing all this down. Otherwise, we're going to we're going to lose it. We're not going to get it to history. Did you have a similar sort of environment as you were growing up and starting your career? Well, when I was a kid, I didn't read any books, so. I was a total like TV guy. I loved to watch sports. I loved to watch cartoons when I was a kid. Uh, but my parents did take us to museums a lot. And I think that really also spurred that interest in seeing things in three dimension and thinking about how you move through a space and learn at the same time. Um, but for me, 
the real spark came in high school. And I had two teachers in high school, Mr. Zemmel and Mrs. Altman, who really kind of took my interest in history and sort of catalyzed it. And it was in those classes that I started to read and I started to absorb. And uh, I remember this very vividly. In senior year of high school, we had like these award ceremonies for graduating seniors. And I won the US government award, which I was completely not expecting to win. But Miss Altman, my teacher, I guess, had nominated it, me for it. And uh, the gift for winning the award was a book. And so I kind of I don't know. I, I feel like at that point, I kind of put it together. I was like, OK, like the world of the book and the world of policy, like this is the way we marry the two, you know, and I kind of took a lot of the things that I took from high school, then propelled me into college and then from college into my professional life. So let's focus in on this concept of history communication. And it's it's one that I know you you know sort of been working, you've written about it you know, and in your public history work, you've, you've talked about it, but I think people should know what you mean when you talk, and we're going to talk about e-history as well and talk about your book, but at a sort of background level, when you talk about communicating history, Jason, what do you mean by that? So the idea for history communication came when I worked at the Library of Congress. So we, we talked about how I worked in museums. After I worked in museums, I ended up working in archives and libraries for a bit. I worked at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I worked at the New York Historical Society, the New York Public Library. And eventually I found my way to the Library of Congress where I worked for seven years. The first two and a half years, I worked at the Veterans History Project, collecting the oral histories of veterans. And then for the next four and a half years, I worked at the John W. Kluge Center, which is the scholar center inside the library. When I was at the Kluge Center, <clears throat> We had a senior scholar position in astrobiology. And the guy who held that chair for the first time was David Grinspoon, who I encourage people to follow on Twitter. Fascinating guy. And it was through David that I got introduced to this world of science communication, which you surely know well. But science communicators basically are a, a subdiscipline or a wing of the sciences who really think critically and analytically about how science and scientific information gets communicated through various media, whether it be legacy media or social media, and how it can best affect public policy. And I began suggesting to colleagues around 2014, 2015, that history should do the same, that we should have a subfield called history communication, and that we should invest in training history communicators. The idea being that, yes, historians communicate all the time, whether it's in the classroom or in a museum, but we really don't have a lot of data about the efficacy of our communication. Like we don't have the same type of reports, scholarly articles and robust infrastructure supporting history communication the way the sciences have built for science communication. So I began to look into science communication and I realized that this had been a concerted effort over decades to sort of build that infrastructure, to raise funding, to create fellowships, to offer training, graduate programs, you can master's degree in science communication now. And so I began suggesting history should do the same. Uh, I received a lot of support. I received, as to be expected, some pushback, some people claiming that this was already covered in public history and other places. But a group of us felt like there was really something here. So we got together, we had a series of workshops. We actually built a history communication curriculum and a history communication course. That course has been taught at a couple of universities. Wayne State uh, taught a version of it. Uh, Marla Miller at UMass taught a version of it. Uh, sort of something similar has been taught at Westchester University and at Purdue. And now Wayne State actually has a history communication lab where students can do all kinds of inter interesting history communication projects. So this is still a field that is growing. And one of the things that I have always said from the outset is that I don't have a monopoly on what history communication can or should be. You know, I've been a cheerleader and I've been an instigator, instigator, but much like there is no uniform definition of public history 40 and 50 years after the field has been created, uh, I'm not sure there has to be a uniform definition of what history communication is. I think the more important thing is to build the infrastructure where we can analyze critically how history is getting communicated through various media, such as podcasts and Twitter and things like that. And we can have data that we can actually rely on to back up our assumptions about what works and what doesn't, and to build community and infrastructure, whether it be 
fellowship programs, coursework, mini cons, I think it's all on the table. And so at this point, we've actually created something called the History Communication Institute. It's very, very, very early stages for it. But the idea is to really start to formalize some of the stuff into training, into resources, into community, into consulting, and connect a lot of different people who are thinking around this idea. I'm really fascinated by your uh, you know, drawing the sort of analogy to science communication and particularly this point. Um, so that seems to grow from two different strands. One is uh, government funders who were interested to know how well the public uh, was prepared uh, to understand complicated scientific ideas. And I know that goes back into the Cold War and the sort of post-World War II government push in you know, funding science and technology, both in universities, but all the way down um, into the elementary school level. So that's sort of one strand. But the other you point to is, is to try to understand more from the scientist's point of view how, how poised they were to influence policy. And those are perennial. I mean, I wish there was a longer track record of government interest in funding historical education. We'll come to that. But this other issue around policy efficacy, I mean, I, I, a week doesn't go by that we don't see in the front page of a major uh, newspaper uh, some sort of story that tries to grapple with the problem um, of the disconnect between what's known in terms of professional history and what gets made into policy. So much so that it's sort of a standing joke among historians that it's, you know, they'll listen to us 50 years later after we're dead and gone and our, our books are forgotten, you know, that we're, we're, I don't want to say irrelevant, but we're, all, we're never really consulted when we're needed. And I, and I think that all comes back to these sort of issues that you put on the table. So let's start with the policy piece. How, when you think about history communication, how do you frame that as a sort of um, uh, attempt to, to craft or react to a policy agenda? How do you connect those two? I can't tell you, I mean, just one more thing. I mean, you know this too. How many times there's grant proposals or various things that historians do, and I'm guilty of this too. We always say, and there will be policy implications of this work. But we're not actually usually really trained in explaining how there will be policy implications of our work. I'm not blaming the historical profession. It's usually outside of our brief. But to assert that and then not know how to follow through on that or even measure whether or not it's true, that's a problem, I think. Yeah. I mean, listen, there's a lot there we could get into. That could be a whole nother podcast, right? Just talking about history and policy. There's, there's a couple of interesting things that are happening. So there's obviously the Luskin Center for History and Policy at UCLA, and they're doing some stuff on the very local level, whether it be with LA politicians or even with California elected officials to try to introduce more history policy stuff. They, they write these reports uh, that are 10 to 12 pages long, and they try to shop them around to various elected officials in California to try to advance particular policy agendas. There's also some stuff happening in the UK with a history and policy shop there, where they have some connections with people who are civil servants or in the House of Commons, and they try to push policy papers towards them. But the two things that are really critical in both of those are networks. And so one of the things that being on the ground here in DC allows me to do is it allows me to work and navigate within networks because policymaking is very much a networked world. Uh, people who are on the Hill are talking to people at particular think tanks, who are getting information from particular academics that they may have personal relationships with. And that's where the spin cycle happens. And a lot of times historians at Drexel or Middle Tennessee State or uh, Emory aren't consulted because they're just not in the network. So I think part of it is, is being in the network and sort of being where the sausage is made. And uh, that's one of the things I try to do at the Library of Congress. It's one of the things I tried to do at the LePage Center, I will, although I will say there wasn't much appetite for it in academia when I was there. Uh, and it's one of the things that I'm also now back on the ground doing here, both at the Wilson Center and with the History Communication Institute. The other thing, though, is that the, the policymaking world is also very dialogical, right? So um, long essays, long books, long briefs, these are not things that are typically read with any close scrutiny. Uh, it's a lot of, 
back and forth. It's a lot of one or two line emails. It's a lot of let's meet for a 20 minute coffee on Capitol Hill. It's a lot of send me a summary of what you've written and point me to more resources. Uh, sometimes you find people will consult the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress for information on policy and their briefs. Uh, they can be on a little bit of a longer side, but a lot of times like they have things really condensed into short paragraphs. So even if you don't read the whole report, you just get one or two bits and you can integrate that into your thinking. So when you think about history of communication in that framework, it's a whole apparatus, right? It's it's the way you write, it's the, the, the reports that get generated, it's being in the networks, it's conversations over email, it's conversations over coffee, it's networking, it's it's schmoozing, it's doing the whole policy making circuit. And that's just not a thing that a lot of historians have training in. It's also not something that a lot of historians can do because they're also busy teaching and writing books and writing journal articles and serving on editorial boards for journals and uh, doing tenure committee stuff and evaluating other colleagues teaching and holding office hours. And there's only so many hours in the day. So. Some of these things are structural. Some of them are very like kind of knowing the nuts and bolts of how policy gets made, but they all do relate to these questions of history of communication. I think that's one avenue for HISCOM. I don't think it's the only one. So that also then becomes a question of how much do you devote to the policy side and how much do you devote to other things like doing stuff on YouTube or Twitter? Well, I wonder, you know, during this time of the pandemic, I mean, um, history of medicine, history of nursing, history of public health, history of science more generally. Uh, I mean, these are were already thriving fields. And I have to say that my, to my colleagues in, in those fields, I think they have done better um, overall historically as communicators than maybe some other subfields of history. But they've really been in the spotlight throughout the pandemic, naturally, but I have despaired many times too, when you see only the same names, the same two or three scholars reproduced in news um, news pieces, or um, when you see sort of their work, it's kind of what you were just describing, distilled down into a few basic points and then, and then reproduced, whereas the depth of the knowledge that they might bring for historical precedent you know, beyond the 1918 Spanish flu, because there's a lot of historical precedents that go well beyond that to help us understand the time we're living in. Um, I just have, again, I've sort of really been hungry for those, those, that deeper engagement with that work. But as you say, the pressures, if we're talking about policy, the pressures of time uh, and of summary are, are too great, I suppose. And so, I mean, there, it's, it feels like a structural problem the way you've described it, but it's also a really urgent problem. It's a life or death problem, I think. I mean, again, you know, sometimes we say, well, we haven't learned from history. That can be fine. That's fine to say. And, and that might have you know, some importance. But this has been a matter of life and death in these past two years, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I think we as historians and scholars, too, have to have some empathy for the people who are actually doing the work. The people who are actually doing the work are not the members you see on television holding press conferences. It's the staff. It's the committee staff and the staff in the offices. And I know those people and I've been in conversation with them and they are completely exhausted during COVID. And now with build back better, they are working 16 hours a day on the Hill, trying to get legislation through. And they have so much pressure coming down on them from the white house. They have pressure coming down on them from their peers and colleagues. They're battling with other offices to get information or to get votes. And the bandwidth is just, there's only so much of it, right? There's only, there's only so much bandwidth that, that these people have. And oftentimes these people are like 25, 30 years old. You know, it's, it, it's not like they are um, PhD scholars in their own right. So, so they are in impossible situations just because of the climate, the political climate, the media climate, the, the public health climate that we're in. And the chances of them reading the 400 page book that has all that depth and nuance and sophistication is like slim to none. So um, I know it's disappointing for scholars sometimes uh, when that doesn't happen. And, and there's this sort of like, if only they would read my book. Um, but I, I do think while I agree with that sentiment, 
knowing the people on the other side of the equation, I do think we also need to have some empathy and understand the, the pressures and, and constraints that they're facing. And this is one of the reasons why we did this project at the LePage Center with the Philadelphia Inquirer, which you probably remember, because I wanted to get journalists and historians in the same room, not only to share information, but just to have more empathy for the struggles that both sides are facing, right? The constraints and the pressures and the structural differences that make it so hard to integrate good historical scholarship into the daily sausage of newsmaking. And that was one of the really valuable things that came out of that meeting in 2019 that we had in the Inquirer newsroom. I think there really was the first steps towards better understanding about the pressures that both sides are under. And it's only that is the first step to finding better ways to collaborate. And I think the same is true with policymakers. Uh, policymakers just kind of want information quickly without thinking about all the challenges that poses for scholars. And scholars just want to get audience with policymakers and have them listen to their stuff without understanding the challenges that policymakers face. And so if there are ways that we can build empathy and build connections and networks, that will be, I think, the road towards better integration. Just to linger on that for a second, I'm glad you brought journalism into this. Um, and, you know, as, as you said, the, the pressure of, of deadline, which now is a is a 24 hour news cycle deadline, so it never ends, um, puts enormous, enormous strain on journalists. And every journalist in the newsroom has become a COVID journalist in this time. So I, I wonder maybe you could say a little bit about how, you, how, you know, with your thinking of this in terms of history communication and sort of the role of an interlocutor such as yourself to show where those connections can be built. Um, what are your findings right now? I mean, aside from that everyone's busy and, and needs to find a way um, to connect, I mean, I, I struggle with this. This is one of the reasons I founded COVID Calls is I wanted to have a place where scholars who might have devoted a career to writing about the history of vaccination, we could have a one hour conversation that then journalists could find and could use that as a basis to go forward with their work. And, and I know they don't even have an hour to listen. So a lot of times I invite journalists on too, so that scholars can find them. So it, it has to be a two way, it has to be a two way street. And I'm sort of curious of your perspective on this now that you've been really at this for a few years and you mentioned your work at the LePage Center and with the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I think it's tremendously important what you did there. I think we should learn from that, but what have you learned in the meantime? Yeah, just to your point about the news cycle and how demanding it is. So my sister is actually a journalist. She writes for the New York Times now, but she used to work for Hyperallergic which is a very famous art publication. They were putting up literally a, a new story every four hours. So it's not even a 24 hour cycle. I mean, it is crazy, right? And, and we're all sort of stuck in this machinery. And I talk about this in my book, right? We're stuck in this machinery because now we feel like we have this imperative to constantly create content so that people will find it and click on it. And the platforms reward us and incentivize it for doing so. So, you know, my sister eventually burnt out at hyperallergic and needed to take a break. So she took a break for her mental health and well-being and cranking out stories left and right. And, and then now she's found herself at a good place doing art criticism for the New York Times. But, um, you know, we as, as people who want to engage with journalists have to be sensitive to that. We can't just expect journalists in these high pressure newsrooms to just drop everything and read our 500 page book and think, oh, that's what I should have written about. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so one of the things I learned though, and this is in the book, I have a whole chapter called The Newsworthy Past, where I talk about how history gets put into service of the news media apparatus. And one of the things I learned is just, we cannot separate these questions about contemporary journalism from the questions of business models. And every conversation I've been in with journalists and newsrooms, even if the business people aren't in the room, it is still so much on the minds of the journalists and editorial staffs because the business models now rely on social media, on clicks and views and shares and spreading things virally. And even when journalists are thinking about stories to write and stories to cover, they're thinking, even if they don't want to admit it, even if it's implicit, they're thinking about how is this gonna play on social media? What's the headline gonna be? Is the headline gonna generate clicks? And how do I report this back to my editorial staff that this was a successful piece? And so where history gets put into service to journalism is if it can be fashioned in a way 
that becomes newsworthy and helps advance the objectives of the media organization. And certainly during COVID, we saw that to be the case. History that could be mobilized in creating stories about and storylines about COVID. And at, to your point earlier, most of that was about 1918, but there were a couple other ones that were thrown in there as well. Um, that became serviceable and workable for journalists in a way that they could quickly integrate it into what they needed to do and into the machinery of journalism as it currently stands. Uh, stuff that couldn't be integrated into that didn't get included. When George Floyd happened and protests broke out and Black Lives Matter burst onto the scene, same thing. The history that could be purposed and repurposed to feed into that media apparatus in a way that would respond to breaking news, current headlines, what was happening on social media, that gets airtime. The stuff that cannot does not. And that's what I talk about in my book, in the chapter on the newsworthy past, and how that can bring certain histories to our attention on social media and online, and how it prevents other histories from never seeing the light of day. So, so that's one of the things that I've learned. Um, and I've also learned a lot, too, about just how to work with journalists and editors and helping them with what they're dealing with in terms of the headline pressures, the generation of news pressures, and the financial pressures, which are very, very real for many, many publications, unless you're named the New York Times. So um, just want to remind folks, you're listening to COVID Calls. I'm talking to Jason Steinauer today, and he's the author of History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice book, Jason. Congratulations on it. And I'm sure it will be read and, and discussed. And I want to just give a quote from it. It's also a good, straightforward read. I mean, it's well written and it's the ideas are sort of there on, on every page, which I really appreciate. And um, I just want to, because it comes right to the core of things here. You say uh, in the book, as all media incur costs to make, so much of e history, so now we're talking and we're talking about this concept of e history, electronic history, is also commercially motivated. E history is often less concerned with the creation of new knowledge than it is in repackaging existing knowledge into an efficient social product in order to advance a personal, political, ideological, or commercial agenda. I feel like a lot of times we just, that we have to have that conversation, that that can be a stumbling point right out of the gate, particularly for historians or people in museum settings, anywhere in, they're in the nonprofit sector, where they're at, constantly cautioned against engaging in things which are for profit. And they may have intentionally made career choices to be in a space that seems to be somehow immune from profit and loss concerns. And, um, we could, that's a longer conversation, whether or not that's realistic and accurate in any way, shape or form, be that as it may, that, at that central point, and you were just making it about what's going on in the newsroom. Um, it's, I think we have to start from there that, uh, when we think about history moving into different forms and different products in particularly in social media and online digital spaces it has to be seen in the context of capitalism it has to be seen in the context of of the market so talk me down from that or talk me through that a little bit and how do you have that conversation um and it's not only scholars making history i want to be clear about that there's people making history and writing good history in all different venues and formats but still how do you have that conversation with a researcher or scholar who says, I want people to read my stuff and, and I wanted to get out there on social media. And then they don't want to talk about this context that you've, that you've placed for us just about the need to think of it as a transaction. This is one of the reasons why we've started the history communication Institute. We need a space to have those conversations and we don't have it. Uh, it doesn't happen at the AHA. It doesn't happen at the NCPH. It doesn't happen inside academia. I know. I tried for four years to stimulate this conversation in academia. No one was interested. So um, that's one of the reasons why I felt like we needed to create a space. One of the things I feel like I've done in my whole career is I've been a space creator. So I've tried to create new spaces for conversations, whether it's on Clubhouse or whether it's in museum exhibits. And I feel like the History Communication Institute has to be that new space where we can talk about these types of things. Because I think you're exactly right. Um, and uh, not to toot my own horn a little bit, but um, this to me seemed like a very obvious point that no one had yet put down on paper. And just to, to the other point you made about the book and how, like I wrote this book initially 
And then I totally rewrote it. And I rewrote it because not only did I want it to be factually accurate and honest and well-researched, but I wanted it to be well-written. And I felt like the first version wasn't well-written enough. So I completely rewrote it in a journalistic style to be incredibly accessible, to be straight to the point, to not have jargon, and just to kind of get everything out there in as plain English as possible. So I'm, I'm really kind of like heartwarmed to hear you say that because I worked really hard on trying to make this a well-written book, not just a well-researched book. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why people from tech and journalism are interested in it because it's not uh, as dense as maybe some other academic mono monographs. Um, but the reason this all came up is because I did a lot of research on tech for this book. I talked to people in Silicon Valley. I read stuff that comes out of Silicon Valley. And it's very interesting when you do that because the way tech people understand their what they're doing is very different from the way journalists write about tech and also from, different from the way that scholars interpret and analyze tech. And so part of marrying that gulf or, or shrinking that gulf was one of the challenges that I had in doing this research and writing the book. But the more I talked to people in tech, the more I thought about tech, the more I researched tech, the more I realized you just cannot separate it from its capitalist commercial agenda. I mean, it just, it's inescapable. Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, these are all massive, neoliberal, uber capitalist, hyper commercial enterprises. And invariably, that is baked into the platforms. And when you communicate on these platforms and you rely on these platforms to share your ideas, you're buying into that enterprise, whether you like it or not. And so one of the themes throughout the book is how the platforms and the way they're designed incentivize certain content and bury others. And the more I did the research, the more I realized that the content that sort of had this commercial imperative or this commercial agenda was oftentimes the ones that were succeeding because that was best aligned with the values of the platform that it was mm. being created on. And I just think that's based on my research and five and a half years working on this book, that's kind of where I've landed. And if that upsets people, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's just kind of what I found. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I appreciate that, and and I guess I'm one of these people who's sort of hopeful. I mean, I spend a lot of time working in trying out this, you know, the the podcasting medium, and and I mean, some of the best follows on on Twitter are historians. I mean, and they're doing very, some of them are doing very well on on Twitter, and so I wonder, you know, I want to come to some of the concepts in the in the book because it does it gives us something to think about, you know, when you when you view content, historical content through the lens of what Twitter needs to succeed, for example, um, it does, it forces you to think a little bit about um, the nature of the content. I don't think it has to necessarily make the content dumb. And so that's a, a sort of fundamental proposition. I'm happy for people to disagree with me about that. It has to make it short, but there's also a lot of 50 thread Twitter uh 50 post Twitter threads out there that people have read and shared very widely that gets a lot of traction. I think of Kevin Cruz on, on Twitter, he's giving, a, you know, and he's only one, I think of other colleagues like Monica Green. I mean, they're giving history content and some of it is very deep with links that take people out in all directions. And they're doing it in a way that also sort of projects a persona uh, as a person who's learned, but, you know, like interested in the world and interested in connecting with people. So I think it can be done. A couple of the concepts that you mentioned in the book, the crowdsourced past, for example, nostalgia on demand, these are the ways you break down the chapters as you sort of go through how history is is being disrupted by social media. The viral past, the visual past, the newsworthy past you touched on, the storytelling past, and the role of AI. I read that very hopefully, honestly, because I saw in there a lot of opportunity for people who really have a deep commitment to history to see ways that others are using it and monetizing it and to think about how they fit into those conversations. And again, to bring it back to the pandemic, I don't think that's, I don't think historians have to necessarily just accept that that can only be used for profit. It can also be used for the public good. 
and finding that overlap of those two, I mean, I suppose that's American history in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. Um, gosh, lots there. So first of all, on the issue of Twitter, so Twitter to me is, is a very interesting case study. And um, that chapter could have been a lot longer, but for the sort of sake of the readability of the book and the way the book kind of flows, I kept it kind of brief. I think it's interesting to think about Twitter historically, in other words, as a product of a particular time and place, right? And as I talk about in the book, um, the year that historians joined Twitter in force uh, turned out to be 2016, followed closely by 2017. And we know what happened in 2016 and 2017. So in many ways, Twitter and these rise of celebrity Twitter historians like the Kevin Cruises and the Heather Cox Richardsons of the world was very much tied to electoral politics and the rise of Donald Trump. And not surprisingly, people like Joanne Freeman and Heather Cox Richardson and Kevin Cruz, who built large followings on Twitter, did so by making their scholarship relevant, newsworthy, to the political crises of 2016, circa 2016 to 2019. And so I'm interested to see if that durability has staying power or if it dissipates. And I have evidence to suggest that it's dissipating. In fact, I've done some analysis, which isn't in the book, which I will be, but I will be publishing at a later point, uh, that looks at sort of the median and the average Twitter followers for historians on Twitter. And some of my evidence suggests that it's actually staying stagnant or actually going down for most historians. The exceptions being the handful who have managed to sort of catapult themselves into the world of public intellectual. So when we think about these platforms, I think it's helpful to recognize that the experience of historians and others on these platforms doesn't always marry up with the one or two exceptions and celebrity stars that we use as benchmarks, right? So just because Twitter is working for Kevin Cruz doesn't mean it's working for the hundreds of other historians who are trying to get their ideas out there and engage in public debates. And I think, again, the Kevin Cruz's of the world were able to take advantage of a particularly newsworthy and polarized, highly emotional moment in time where their scholarship could plug in. And not every scholar or historian on Twitter works on the history of the conservative party or the history of Republican politics or the White House, right? And in the book, I talk about how you know, there's a whole range of other historians who work on, let's say, indigenous Bolivian history, for example, whose work never sees the light of day on Twitter because, again, Twitter has a commercial imperative to keep you on the site and to keep you clicking and using and sharing and retweeting. And the more controversial and the more it ties into what's happening in the news, the more Twitter will surface it and other stuff will get buried. So I think the conversation about Twitter is a little bit more nuanced than perhaps we've thought about it before. And this is why I'm excited for both the book and the HCI, because I feel like we need that data, we need that research, and we need to be having those conversations. And then the other book, the rest of the book, as you said, kind of goes to these other different case studies where we start to think about why certain history becomes visible online and why it does not, and what are the underlying factors making some scholarship visible to us and making other scholarship invisible to us. But invariably, all these platforms are commercial enterprises looking to make money and recording, you know, reporting to shareholders on a quarterly basis. So ultimately, they want us to stay on, to stay engaged, to get our data so they can refine their algorithms and build new products. And so even if you are having success on these platforms, you also have to recognize that that's what you're contributing to, for better or for worse. So that's, that's, again, it kind of comes back to where we started with this part of the conversation. It's a bit of an uncomfortable conversation in, in, that you might have with a scholar who would say, I'm ultimately not interested in, if I wanted to make money, I would have gone into law or I'd have done something else. I, I, do, I got into this because I want the ideas to get across. So how do we, how do we engage that? In other words, you know, there, there may be, um, there's a lot of really incredibly valuable content. You focus in the book also on the sort of um, what goes viral and and the the visuals too, like the power just of images, historical images with very small annotation to circulate very widely. 
in the internet. You have a sort of interesting case study in there of that. Um, how do you bring people along, historians who may not see themselves as wanting to contribute to the bottom line in virality, but they are interested in the sharing and the broad sharing of the ideas, which I know sounds like a strange question maybe to a lot of people, like who wouldn't be motivated by making a lot of money out of viral content? But I know a lot of people who really could care less about that part. What they really want to do is just get the ideas out there circulating. Well, the good news is that most people will not make a lot of money from the internet. <laughs> you'll you'll make money for the platforms, but you won't get a lot of money for it. So that there's that. Well, we work in universities anyway, so we're sort of used to that arrangement. <laughs> but I do think that may be where some of the promise of Web 3.0 comes in. Because Web 3, whereas Web 2.0 was very much about posting, Web 3.0, I think, is very much about building. And so that I think might offer some opportunities to, to build communities of knowledge using Web3 tools in a way that is largely autonomous from the megaliths of the Facebooks and the Twitters and the YouTubes of the world. And I think this is actually one of the things that they are afraid of, which is why Facebook is moving so aggressively into Web3. Um, because they're worried that people are going to start spending their time other places and they don't want that to happen because that eats into their bottom line and what they can sell to advertisers. But I think, again, this is a good conversation to have in the History Communication Institute. Uh, what are the possibilities of Web 3 that didn't exist in Web 2, where it was just about posting and blasting out? Um, you know, whether it was tweeting or Facebook posting or Instagram posting or blog posting, Web 3, I think, is going to be built on a very different set of premises. And one of the things I'm trying to focus on now is talking with people in tech who are building Web3 to make sure we have better incentives built into it than we did in Web2. Um, I'm actually, I've actually proposed at the American Association for State and Local History Conference in 2022 to do a workshop with public historians on Web3 to start thinking about that. Um, but there's so much stuff out there now in terms of low code and no code that if there are tools available that you can build on your own platforms using no code and low code, then you can start to build communities that are outside perhaps of the commercial imperatives of web 2.0 and that don't involve some of the, what I would say are pernicious or nefarious incentives of web 2.0. I just wanna, we're almost up on time. I just wanna remind everybody that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to Jason Steinauer today, the author of history disrupted how social media and the World Wide Web have changed the past. So um, just, you, you know, I guess asking historians to predict the future is always a dicey game, but but let's let's engage with it for just a second. And you just gave us a little bit of that, talking about Web 3.0 and the move to a more decentralized um, web experience, particularly for content creators who might not want to think that they have to put everything that they, every idea they have had up on Facebook to somehow engage some audience out there that they may not be familiar with. Um, it would be really nice if people could leapfrog over that and and get into something that's um, where people can reach audiences uh, more directly without the interlocutor of these big tech companies. I don't know how we'll ever do that. Maybe you can. That's why I should take your your uh, your seminar. That's why I should attend your. <laughs> that's why I should attend your workshop on Web 3.0. But I think I I understand the spirit of it, and I guess that's one of the things on the horizon. What else do you see? And I don't want to traffic too much in the doom and gloom of the death of the humanities. The humanities has died lots of times and, uh, and it's been recreated lots of times. Um, the job crisis is real though. People are hurting. Universities are not replacing tenure track positions. Uh, they're not replacing a lot of places, they're not replacing positions at all. So it is a time of real concern among people in museum studies and public history and in conventional history, um, university spaces. Can you give me something hopeful here in the way that, because the thing I always try to figure out, if I go to any bookstore, well, such a thing exists anymore, online bookstore, turn on any, uh, turn on Netflix, you know, look and see what movies are hot. These are history, these are history inflected products. These are historical narratives. This is what people want. Um, so I'm trying to square that with the decline of the market for professional historical services, shall we say, university-based. And I'm looking for some good news, Jason. 
Well, let's see. You should know that I, I, I went into this book five and a half years ago, optimistic, and I left pessimistic. So uh, I, will, I will preface with that. Uh, I can find some good news for you, but I do agree with you that the headwinds are strong and they've been made even stronger by the pandemic. Um, history museums have experienced a 70% decline in visitorship during the pandemic. Now, obviously that's because they were closed a lot of the time. So this is a little bit of an aberration. And the people at ASLH and others will argue that they were kind of holding steady <clears throat> prior to the pandemic, which I think to a certain extent is true. But the world is changing fast and tech is changing fast. And where that young audience is for history museums and history departments, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we can still cater to retirees who uh, have a little bit of money and a little bit of time to stroll through a museum on a Sunday afternoon, maybe want to bring their grandkids with them or visit a historic site or pick up a 400 page book and read it. And that audience will still probably be around uh, for the foreseeable future. But the expectations of younger audiences are really changing quickly. And the experiences that they want to have both in physical spaces and in digital spaces are changing quickly. And this is, again, a reason why I think the HCI is so important, because we need to have spaces to experiment. And oftentimes that experimentation is not possible inside academia or inside of museums because of bureaucracies, because of entrenched ideas about how things are supposed to operate, budgetary constraints, et cetera. Where is the hope? Where is the optimism in all this? I do... I tend to put my optimism in people. And I can say that on the, the few years that I've been on this history communication journey and written this book and now with the HCI, I just continue to meet such amazingly inspiring and courageous people like yourself, for example, who you know I'm just incredibly impressed by what you've done with this show and your commitment to these ideas. And so I think, I always believe that if you get really good, smart people in a room, together talking, diverse, inclusive conversations, you can figure things out. And that's one of the things I hope to do with the HCI is get the right smart people in the conversation so we can figure some of these things out. I also think that there is some optimism because I, from my conversations with people in the tech world, I think more and more people in tech are waking up to the fact that the promises they sold us in the early days of the web in web 2.0 didn't come to fruition and they need to be to do better hmm. with web 3.0 and so i have found a lot more receptivity in the past year and a half in my conversations with tech in silicon valley and venture capitalists and angel investors and other people who are building than i would have ordinarily expected even when i'm being critical of tech so I do see opportunities, but to seize on those opportunities, we're going to need funding, we're going to need resources, and we're going to need institutional support from places that maybe in the past have been too afraid or too entrenched to act. And I'm not sure if that's academia at the moment. It may have to come from, from outside of academia. I just want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls and you can usually catch COVID calls live at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And today I've been talking with Jason Steinauer, who's the author of History Disrupted, how social media and the World Wide Web have changed the past. And he's also the creator of the History Communication Institute, and that's at historycommunication.com. Please be sure to check that out. If these themes are ones that are interesting to you, and I, I'm sure they are, hope they are. The people who listen to this podcast are all about trying to figure out how to take expert knowledge and unlock it and put it out there and make it available for people to use in the context of this pandemic. Jason, um, glad to see um, these ventures, glad to see this book. Um, I'm sure it'll be widely discussed and thanks for your time today, really appreciate it. Thank you, Scott, and kudos to all you are doing. Uh, like I said, this podcast is really impressive. The fact that you've kept it going through the pandemic. I know a lot of people who've been on your podcast, so I'm now excited to count myself among them. 
And I also just want to salute you for all the work that you've done over the years um, in history, communication and public history and academic history and other places that touch history. So you're a, you're a role model for all of us. So um, any way that I can support you through the HCI or otherwise, please let me know. That's kind. Thank you, Jason. Stay healthy, everyone. And we'll see you next time on COVID Calls.